First of all, I just want to welcome you all. Welcome to the first ARDRA Cohort 4 uh, Research Presentation Series. Um, I think that most of you are familiar with the program, but for those of you who aren't, the program funds PhD and master's students to promote independent research in the field of disability studies. Uh, so today we have with us four of our cohort four students who have completed their research projects um, and are going, going to present on the findings of their research today. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to introduce myself and introduce the Ardra team. Um, so my name is Erica Smitka, and I'm the program coordinator of the Ardra Small Grant Program at PRI. Uh, and with me today from PRI, I also have Margaret Lassiter, um, but I'll introduce, I'll hand it over to Laura to introduce our team at SSA. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Laura King. I'm the project officer for the RDA program here at SSA. Um, and also um, my coworker, Kristen Harper, is with us. Um, welcome to everyone. I'm so very glad that you could join us. Um, I'm very excited to hear about our students' research, and I hope you are too. And with that, I will hand it back to Erica. <laughs> Thanks so much, Laura. It's a nice appearance from your cat there. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, after each student presents, we'll have a couple of minutes where you can ask questions. So feel free to unmute yourself at that time, or uh, you can ask your question in the chat uh, and we'll grab it from there. Um, but as I said today, we will have um, four students presenting with us. Um, and then we will also have a question and answer session at the end. So if there's something that pops up that you didn't have a chance to ask as we went through, you can uh, hold on to that question at the end. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce our first presenter, Catherine Hurley. Uh, Catherine is a PhD student in counseling at George Washington University's Graduate School of Education and Human Development. Catherine. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, and hello to everybody. I'm delighted to be here to talk to you a little bit about my, uh, my research project. Um, and thank you all for being here. So I'll be presenting um, on my project workplace and job search disclosure strategies for adults with autism spectrum disorder. And this will be an analysis of, um, I'm sorry, I've lost the, the view of the slides, um, but I can do it without them if you need to. But it's so an analysis of applicant and employee experiences. So we'll be looking at, um, at uh, people's experiences with job search and um, and actually disclosure or not disclosing in the workplace. And I'm presenting and my, my mentor is Dr. Maureen McGuire Coulette's um, also out of GW. So if you don't mind going to the next slide, Erica. Sure. Thank you. Yep. So a little bit of background um, as we get started with, you know, talking about you know, what's the issue, why did I decide to look into this? So adults with autism spectrum disorder, and you'll see on the slides and I'll, I'll, I'll be saying ASD um, from time to time, face increased barriers in obtaining and maintaining employment. So to give you an idea, in spring of 2021, uh, 2022, 2021 um, the general population had an unemployment rate of about 5.7%. Adults with autism spectrum disorder, one of these studies, there are many, found that adults um, with ASD who were in their early 20s had an employment rate of just 58% outside the home. So we're looking at above 40% unemployment, which is also lower than when these studies looked at individuals with other disabilities, such as intellectual disabilities, who had a rate of 78%, um, speech and language impairments, 91%. So we're looking at something in particular for adults with ASD, where there are some challenges that might be unique to this group. So researchers speculate that part of the cause if you go back one, um, of this disparity might be due to the social impacts of the disorder. So part of the, um, the clinical diagnosis of this disorder has two main components. And one of those is in social communication and social interaction impairments across multiple contexts. So researchers have pointed to um, that maybe is the issue where particularly in interview settings, for instance, people with autism spectrum disorder may have issue um, when working with neurotypical individuals. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit um, in, in kind of the, um, when I say working with, I'll, I'll talk about kind of a first impression study in a moment to talk about this kind of two-way street of communication. 
Um, so research has pointed to disclosure um, as an area of interest, and that's what we'll be looking at, towards addressing these barriers with potential pluses, like you know, getting those workplace accommodations, and potential minuses, such as the stigma and discrimination um, that may be um, against this population. So if you don't mind going to the next slide, Erica. Thank you. So in these first impression slides that I spoke about, um, there are a number of studies, and I'll kind of focus on Sess and, and Morrison 2018, where individuals um, in, this, in this one study, individuals with autism spectrum disorder and neurotypical individuals were recorded, they were auditioners for a you know, fake pilot of a show. Um, and the subjects who are all college age students watched these videos and, and rated their first impressions. Individuals with ASD got lower on average first impression um, reactions from this group. So then the, um, the, the researchers then said, well, they labeled this person has autism spectrum disorder and this person is neurotypical. When they were labeled, um, people with ASD on average, their first impression scores went up. What I think is particularly interesting about this is that the researchers also did a round where they mislabeled individuals. So um, it person, a person could be labeled as ASD, whether they had ASD or not, um, or neurotypical, whether they were or not. And the first impressions went up again of people with AS, people who were labeled ASD. And this I kind of want to talk about as a through line of this presentation about this idea of communication as this, this through way street. Um, so some of the, the first impression study takeaways are that these results could be suggestive that disclosure could be positive for individuals with ASD when interacting with neurotypical um, em employers or potential employers. Although these studies are isolated to first impressions and it's not really real world examples, but notably the raters marked improved scores for those who did not have ASD but were marked as such. So it seems that in some ways the reaction is divorced from what the auditioner did or who they were, um, but instead how the rater perceives their labels. So when we do studies on people with autism and communication, I just wanna highlight that um, it's a two-way street and that communication is, is about perception also of the individual. So the purple of the other individual. So the purpose of this study is to learn more about the real world experiences of adults with ASD around disclosure and employment, including strategies and consequences, positive, negative, and neutral of the personal decisions made around disclosure. And I'll be looking at this in a quantitative and qualitative way. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. So some additional considerations that this research looks at um, when we were surveying individuals was we asked about, and we're interested in people with intersecting LGBTQ plus and autism identities. So something to note about this population, individuals with ASD are three times or more um, likely to identify as LGBTQ plus than the general population um, from numerous, numerous studies. And that the LGBTQ plus community is also uh, you know, a community that's very aware of the idea of disclosure, um, which is called within the community kind of coming out and potentially negative or positive or neutral uh, consequences to that in the workplace and other areas. And we also looked at the experiences of those who are eligible for and or utilizing social security benefits. So you'll see without, uh, with, um, throughout the results that I'm kind of looking at all these subgroups also. Don't mind going to the next slide, please. So the methods of this study was an anonymous online survey with 28 questions and opportunities for both qual and quant responses where you could write in um, and also kind of choose answers. And, and I'll be going through the three sections of the survey where the first third was demographics, second third, the person's work history, and then on their, their experiences with disclosure. Um, the inclusion criteria is people who are 18 years old or older and had a diagnosis of ASD or a related diagnosis that they might have been given in the DSM-4 or earlier, for example, Asperger's disorder. And there were 31 total participants. We had more engagement, but people who, who finished the entire three sections of the survey were 31 individuals, 12 reported to be female, 17 male, one person was agender and one person gender fluid. One of the limitations you'll see me noting later is we, we looked at sexual orientation and not um, gender identity because there, weren't enough, uh, there wasn't enough diversity. So we weren't able to look at people who are trans or gender fluid, for instance. 24% uh, reported to be white, um, one black or African-American, one Hispanic, Latinx or Spanish origin, one American Indian, um, and three reported to be more than one race. So again, we see not, we, we'd love to see more diversity in the sample also. So we weren't allowed to look at, we weren't able to look at other multiple marginalized identities, such as those related to race or ethnicity. 
If you don't mind going to the next slide, please, Erica. Um, so ethnicity, again, we saw most of the participants reported to be not Hispanic or Latinx, so another limitation. Um, so as I noted, the study was a little limited in um, diversity in those ways. Participants' ages ranged from 18 to 55, with an average age of just over 33 years old and a standard deviation um, with 11 years of plus or minus um, that population. And the average age of participants when they received their diagnosis for ASD was 19 years old, um, with 16 years on either side for standard deviation. If you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, thank you. So, and we, we see also, we're gonna look at sexual orientation. I saw this kind of a, a one of the folk guy here. Um, 20 participants identified as heterosexual. And then we had those who identified as something other than heterosexual, um, people who are asexual, bisexual, questioning, and other, um, as you can see, heteroflexual, heteroflexual, demisexual, not really interested and no response. We're put into, that was about 35% of our participants and they were in a, in a group called LGBTQQA+, um, which I'll, be referring to LGBTQ+, um, and the study was limited in the way I discussed earlier in terms of gender identity. So participants who were receiving or were eligible for social security benefits, we asked a number of, kind of different questions about this. Nine participants were currently receiving um, social security benefits, 17 were not, two weren't sure, Two indicated they were eligible as an adult um, and are now receiving SSDI. Um, one was eligible but job seeking to avoid applying for benefits. Um, and so we have 35% who were receiving Social Security and 58% who were not receiving um, Social Security. So we'll look at the, that subgroup also. Um, thank you for going to the next slide. So quantitative analysis, as I said, we'll be looking at quant and qual. Quantitative analyses included analyzing the demographic statistics, frequencies, and odd ratios, which I'll go through in a moment. And the odd ratios were used to analyze group differences between the, um, the heterosexual and those, and those who had a minority sexual orientation, those two groups. If you don't mind going to the next slide. The qualitative side, um, we had responses that were related to disclosure strategies, which was something we're really interested in looking at you know, people's own experiences with this in the workplace and their job search process. That was really the heart of the study um, in terms of bringing out those voices and those experiences, we hoped. And experiences were coded for themes and analyzed for similarities, differences, and other pertinent information that I'll, I'll review um, in these slides. So in terms of who's employed, who wasn't employed, 19 participants were currently employed and 12 were not. Um, seven of those who were currently employed were looking for other employment. So maybe suggesting underemployment. Um, of those who are not currently employed, eight were looking for employment. And the odds of being employed if you're in the LGBTQ group um, was, was higher than for those who identified as heterosexual. So the LGBTQ group um, had a, was slightly higher odds of being employed. And in terms of who was using social security, um, the, those who are LGBTQ plus were 2.4 times more likely to be utilizing and were eligible for social security benefits than the heterosexual participants, which I thought was kind of something of note here, um, which we'll discuss in the results. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please, Erica. So now we'll look at the quantitative analysis and we'll look at these three key questions that this research really focused on. And I'll kind of introduce you to them and go through each, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So those three key questions that this research is really interested in, do you disclose your status as a person with ASD at your current place of employment or past job? Do you tell people, and, and we'll be asking, who do you tell to people tell? Do you disclose your status as a person with ASD in your job search documents? Do you have it somewhere in your resume, in your cover letter and so forth? And that third question is, have you disclosed your status as a person with ASD during an interview? Do you tell, the, the interviewee or, or the interviewer or someone else during that stage in the job search process. Um, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So let's look at the results of that first, that first question. Do you disclose at your place of employment? So we had 39%, we had 12 people who said yes, always. Um, and we had a bulk who said yes, sometimes. So most of our much higher rate, people are, are disclosing at some point in their current place of employment or past places of employment. Uh, two said no, one had never had a job and one didn't respond. We're seeing the vast majority of this sample discloses always or sometimes. Um, if you don't mind going to the next slide, Erica. 
So we asked some follow-up questions to this. So of the 27 particip participants who indicated they do disclose, sometimes they're always the most common person we asked, so to whom do you disclose? If you do, was their supervisor um, uh, by far and away 84%. The next most common was to coworkers. Um, and then just below that, they disclosed to human resources. But most likely people are, are going to disclose to their supervisor and then to their coworkers. Um, and then four other respondents had other participants, trainees, graduate school admin. Um, and if you don't mind going to the next slide, Erica, please. So now we look at odds ratios when we're looking at the um, LGBTQ plus population, the odds of, of that group always disclosing their ASD status and their place of employment was two times greater than for heterosexual participants. So that group, LGBTQ plus group was more likely than the heterosexual group to always um, or sometimes disclose, uh, to always disclose actually. Um, and no LGBTQ plus participants stated that they, they do not disclose versus two heterosexual participants who do. So we're seeing that this group is more likely to always disclose um, their ASD diagnosis. If you don't mind going to the next. So that second quick key question, do you disclose your status in your job search documents when you're sending your resumes and your cover letter? Um, yeah, so yes, and sometimes we see, you know, 13 and 23%. No was the largest response. Um, and that people at 55% are not disclosing in these documents. And then, you know, I'd ask a little bit of follow-up about that. If you might, if you don't mind going to the next slide, Erica, please. Um, participants who answered that they sometimes disclose, most often stated that they disclose that they have a disability or a disability advocate, but not, they don't disclose their particular ASD status. So most often people were saying that they kind of talk about the groups they were a part of, or they, if they're asked, they say, yes, I have a disability, but they don't talk about autism spectrum disorder um, specifically. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. So when we look again at that LGBTQ group, the odds of individuals in that group disclosing their ASD status was five times higher um, when compared to heterosexual participants. So much more likely to disclose in those documents than the heterosexual group. Um, and they were also more likely to disclose their ASD status in job search documents um, versus sometimes to disclose it. So this, they're more likely to always do it and they're more likely in both groups to do it than the heterosexual group. If you don't mind going to the next slide. So in this third key question, have you disclosed during the interview, which we saw earlier researchers are uh, postulate that maybe this is part of the issue with unemployment um, and ASD, you know, part of it. Um, so we see that, that yes, most people do, um, and sometimes, a few sometimes, and no, 35% saying no. So this is something that we're looking at just over half of people do disclose during the interview process. If you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, those who sometimes disclose, we asked them, you know, what what kind of informed this this idea, and they said that um, they had experiences. They were their decision was kind of colored by they had had dis experiences in the past with discrimination. Um, they talked about speaking about their their diagnosis and things around autism as a strength um, and using it in kind of a strength based conversation, and disclosing that they they will they will talk about it if it comes up, one, one respondent said if it comes up during the interview. And so that's a little bit of our qual right in. So the odds when we're looking at this LBG, LGBTQ group, um, the odds of, of disclosing during the interview um, versus not disclosing was only slightly greater. So nothing significant, only slightly, but still higher. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. So now let's look a bit about the qual around disclosure, what people were, were saying and writing in, um, what we can maybe you know, learn from this. So if you don't mind going to the next slide. So 24 participants, when we're talking about disclosure strategies, so, so what are, do you have strategies around disclosure? And then later on, what are they? Um, so they responded, yes, 24 participants at 77% said, yes, we, we have a strategy around disclosure in regard to their ASD. When coded and looked at, there were three themes that emerged that I'm going to talk about um, now, which are time-based strategies. These were the kind of codes here, the themes. Negative experience related to disclosure and positive experiences related to disclosure. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. So when we talk time-based, during the job application process, um, if and when the applicant is asked if they have a disability or accommodation need, then, then they'll respond. So two participants said, if it it, it, they would kind of react to a question. Two said 
they've disclosed in their job search documents. So before they have that job or if they're called um, for you know an interview or if they're um, there, it's before they have the job. So it's kind of the time base. Two, during the interview process, um, one responded that after a job offer is made, then that, then that um, person will disclose. Shortly after acquiring the job, um, a little bit more frequently, and then during the course of employment, so not during that early stage, but during the course of employment um, for people, so that that's when they disclose. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, so this idea of during the course of employment, um, some of the, the language that came up around that was, you know, as needed, um, if it comes up openly, so there are no misunderstandings, and one, rep and one participant responded, they go as long as possible at their place of employment without disclosing, um, and that also had um, some reflection and negative experience that that person had, ex had experienced, if you don't mind going. Five participants spoke of those perceived negative effects, which are the next theme. So not receiving, the, they kind of perceived that um, when they disclosed, it might have led to not receiving interviews or callbacks after interviews, um, not receiving accommodations or support following workplace disclosure, although they had disclosed and asked for it. And one um, stated they had an experience described as a nightmare um, following disclosure to colleagues. Um, uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Ask. Now, when we look at the positive experiences that um, individuals reported, Six participants listed one or more positive results from their experiences with disclosure, including success in job obtainment, receipt of accommodations that had positive impacts on their work, um, such as uh, raises and so forth, work environment, and in one participant statement was attributed to the receipt of a promotion. And disclosure was also attributed to the avoidance of negative consequences, which we kind of coded as positive, including you know avoiding misunderstanding, avoiding burnout um, for trying to you know, create accommodations for themselves um, and not receive accommodations from the, the employee, the employer. Um, so if you don't mind going to the next slide. So we also asked, how did you, how did you learn your strategies? From whom did you learn these strategies? And 13 responded, they learned them from other people. That was the most common way um, that they reported, including self-advocates, family members, VR specialists, therapists, not in nonprofits and in school settings. Next, from personal experiences and observations, many people had wrote, wrote in about that. And then the other ways were from books, media, and presentations that they had attended. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please, Erica. So discussion, kind of what, what might we be able to take from this information, um, which was just kind of the beginning of asking these questions and learning um, you know, part of people's experiences here. So this research represents a small start to capturing some of these experiences and just kind of uh, glimpses and hints at, um, at other places that we might wanna go and research. Employment rates in terms of what we found and what we talked about at the, the top of the, the 15 minutes or so were at 61%, which was similar to you know, the research as discussed and um, the likelihood of this, this sample being LGBT Q plus was also 35% in keeping with the research. Overall findings suggest that individuals were more often to choose to disclose um, than not to disclose, and they were most likely to disclose their supervisor and then other individuals in the workplace. If you don't mind going to the next slide, Eric. Thank you. Um, while some participants felt comfortable being open about their identity as a person with ASD, some expressed having experienced that stigma and discrimination um, that was a concern in the research and, and to, to many individuals. Um, stigma and discrimination, as we kind of think back on that first impression studies and kind of starting to talk about that are byproducts of how others view individuals or groups of individuals and aren't rooted in the individuals themselves. And that's why I wanna kind of call back that um, assassin paper is that this is communication is really a two way street and whether the person was labeled or not labeled, that that had an, had a difference, whether they had ASD or not ASD. And so we kind of see that the stigma and discrimination is not because of what the person, who the person is, but because of how the neurotypical individual is, is viewing um, things. So, so just the kind of keeping fresh in mind this idea of those first impression studies. Um, and if you don't mind going to the next. And individuals with ASD who are LGBTQ plus were more likely to be employed. So one of the things that we wondered at the start of this were, would multiple marginalization um, cause, cause negative consequences such as you know, unemployment if you wanted to be employed and so forth. And it looked like these, these effects didn't compound in any way. Um, and in fact, 
people with LGBTQ who were LGBTQ plus were more likely to be employed. Um, and these individuals were also those who had ASD, have ASD and are LGBTQ plus also had a higher likelihood to be eligible for and or utilizing social security benefits. So perhaps the takeaway um, from that is that this may suggest a need for increased knowledge about an implementation of services for this population who may be showing up um, in more, more odds wise higher rates um, than other groups or heterosexual groups who, are, who have ASD. Um, and if you don't mind going to the next slide, Erica, please. And finally, I just wanted to thank PRI SSA, my mentor, and uh, you know everyone who so generously provided their experiences and shared their lives for the study. And um, and thank everybody um, who's here today. And and there, the next few slides are just references. But if you have any questions, we'll or anything, I'd be happy to chat about it um, as they come up. So thank you so much for your time, and thank you everybody for your help with this project. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was that was really great. Um, so we'll open the session now for any questions for Catherine. Um, I'll uh, I can kick us off here. So, um, Catherine, have you thought about what have you thought about in terms of next steps? Um, have you thought about ways in which you could engage uh, this kind of unique population, individuals who identify as um, LGBTQA plus with ASD? Uh, what are your thoughts on the best ways to to outreach to that community? Well, um, I, I wanted to you know, preemptively thank uh, PRI and SSA because that's my next project um, working with ARDRA is to work specifically um, serving and talking to getting that qual and quant information from this specific population. So doing specific outreach um, to talk to folks um, who have ASD and are LGBTQ plus so that we can learn more about their specific um, experiences in the world with employment and other kind of quality of life um, metrics and just just learn more to your question Erica about um, kind of focus in on, on what their life experiences are um, to hopefully you know learn more about what we can do on the other end too um, for employment and other outcomes. Thanks for asking. That. Absolutely. And thanks, thanks. and thanks for the, the next project. <laughs> <laughs> We're excited to see the results. So. <laughs> Um, any other questions for Catherine here? Uh, feel free to either just unmute yourself or you can again ask the question in the chat. All right, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, if anyone does have a question for Catherine, feel free to you know hang on and, and ask it after the rest of the presentations. Um, I do have just one more question for you though, Catherine. Sure. I know that it was kind of a, uh, maybe not quite what you were expecting in terms of, of outcomes that individuals who identified as, or who had uh, ASD and identified as LGBTQA plus uh, would have higher rates of employment. Did you come across mm -hmm. anything in your lit review of why that might be um, the case? Or I get, you probably can't really make no. too many assumptions. So so no, and that's a, that question, it's, um, it's something that when I, I couldn't find in the research and there's something that looking backwards is not great, but looking forward is really exciting in terms of being a researcher and looking at this is kind of having something unexpected like that is, is well, what's happening? Um, and in the next study, kind of looking at um, what other, um, you know, factors are there? What, how can we kind of dice up and look at kind of predictively look at um the stats of what we're coming up with so i don't have anything that i could hang my hat on right now um but i hope to in a year's time have just the beginning of a hook to hang a hat on to say you know here's what we think but but nothing from this study that i could kind of say for sure this is what we found but but an interesting result i thought Absolutely. Thanks for that, Catherine. Thank um, and we do have a question from Dalton in the chat here. So Dalton said, when thinking intersectionally about disability and sexuality, how do you slash will you consider geographic differences in legal employment discrimination against LGBTQ identified folks? Uh, and he also said, thanks for your research. Um, thank you. And thank you for that question. Um, I So it's a good question because a lot of this research was kind of as in last summer, as it started to become no longer legal to fire people who are LGBTQ plus um, 
except for something called the ministerial exception, except for places that are religious, uh, you know, by their makeup. So there's still that is still legal, but that that changed. So now there's kind of federal protection, but there's that's a uh, federal protection. Um, that's not like a cement floor. So you could still, things can still fall through the cracks and there are still, um, particularly for individuals who are transgender, um, other things that are still legal um, throughout the country. So I think that to the questioner's question, that's a great thing for me to keep in mind as I think about the next results that although it's kind of federally, um, we have more protections than we used to, um, that it is something to keep in mind with biases and other things that aren't you know, legally mandated and also some things that are legally on the books. Okay, so I think that the question is one for me to keep in mind as I move forward to think about maybe looking at the quadrants of the country or so forth and adding that as a question um, in, the, in the, next, the next research project. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you for that question, Dalton. <laughs> Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. If there are any other questions for Catherine, as I said, um, you can hold on uh, and ask those at the end. Um, but we'll move on to our next presentation here. So our next student is uh, Michelle Vasquez, who is a PhD student in, uh, in the Dreben School of Education at the University of the Incarnate Word. Michelle? Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, again, like she just said, Mich Michelle Vasquez, University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio, Texas. I will be presenting my research title, Discovering SSI Benefits, Social Services and Support for Children with Disabilities, an Action Research Approach. And my faculty mentor is Dr. Alfredo ortiz Argan. He's an action researcher and design facilitator. Thank you, <laughs> Eric Gus, um, of Organizational Change Processes and Associate Professor at UIW. Uh, my presentation, next slide, please will include the following. I'm going to be going over the introduction, research design methods, data analysis, findings, discussion, summary, and conclusion. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the study uh, is to examine how parents of children with disabilities, focusing specifically on autism spectrum disorder, find federal programs, social services support. Uh, through the process, I was granted the support of an action research working group at my university where I led a small research team to help me work on this project. And the research study in, uh, originated from an action uh, collaboration that Dr. Ortiz had, uh, this was over a year ago, who was um, posing the question to, to people in the group as far as what are some challenges that people face in the community in regard to health and well-being. And re referring to my personal journey as a parent of a child, with developmental disabilities, um, with 10 years, uh, I shared some of the challenges that I faced in the community attempting to gain access to some of, service, some of these services. So based on the initial conversations, our inquiry grew into it pretty much investigate and address uh, the issues faced by other parents in the community. And so we realized it's really important to understand the experiences of all these parents, uh, which can pa paint a fuller picture of the challenges of their everyday lives and some, Quick stats, so between 2009 and 2017, one out of six children have been diagnosed with developmental disabilities in the US and significant increase over from the previous years and the numbers continue to grow. And one in 1.1 million children in the US receives supplemental security income benefits from the Social Security Administration. Autism spectrum disorder affects one in 54 children in the US and is the fastest growing developmental uh, disability. Uh, disorder. And I wanted to share a little bit more about community-based participatory action research. So it really looks at the concept of health from a multi-dimensional perspective and addressing public health issues in the community, according to Wallerstein. And action research uses participatory and reflective processes to explore real-world situations that impact the lives of people and their well-being, stated by Stringer and Ortiz Argon. One of the key principles of participatory research is to open sharing of knowledge by experienced owners to inform and help foster social change initiatives really to address challenges identified in the sharing process. So for example, bringing parents, healthcare professionals, educators, social workers, um, you know, the stakeholders involved as well, uh, together to discuss barriers for children with autism can put a spotlight on urgent issues needing to be addressed in the community. If you can go to the next slide, please. 
So the study explored the following questions. Uh, really, I wanted to understand, um, we want to understand the idea of how parents perceive, which is number one, how parents perceive and utilize better programs, social service and support. That's really important. Number two was uh, how, and I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm not reading the questions, but I'm just kind of saying what the purpose of the questions was we wanted to understand the barriers that parents face in caring for children with unmet needs in the community. We also wanted to understand the satisfaction of information delivery methods used by healthcare professionals and agencies in accessing the services. And lastly, we also wanted to, we hope to map and evaluate approaches that trigger parents seeking information to become active and knowledgeable advocates for their children. Uh, next slide, please. So um, discussing the research design methods and data analysis, uh, we use a community-based, again, community-based participatory action research approach. That's the uh, initial approach we're, we're planning to move forward with. Uh, parents participate in initial meetings, interviews, digital storytelling workshops, the film screening for phase one of the study, which we're calling uh, this past year phase one. We chose digital storytelling as the idea of reflecting on lived experiences and sharing stories between parents, which would offer rich data. Uh, so to be part of the study, participants need to be over 18 years of age and a parent of a child with disability, such as autism spectrum disorder in San Antonio, Texas. And we created email messages, social media posts, and a flyer to share with local uh, online parent support groups and organizations for distribution. And overall, we recruited 12 participants that re were ready to take part in the study. In preparation for the research activities, uh, our research team met bi-weekly focus on activity planning, training, and conducted pilot workshops with small groups of PhD students with the idea of gaining feedback before implementing the activities with participants. Parents attended individual meet and greet sessions uh, to better understand the project timeline activities and requirements. Uh, this was a crucial step between parents and our research team to really help answer questions and build relationships in the study. And that was really, really important the first year of was really just building these, these good relationships. Uh, and in addition, we had pre-interviews where we conducted 12 initial interviews with parents and we asked about key moments, pathways to services, accessible information, challenges, opportunities, and all the videos were recorded using Zoom web conferencing and transcribed for analysis purposes. Uh, we also offered a total of four digital storytelling writing workshops and three video creation session uh, workshops were based on parents' uh, available schedules. And we presented Story Center's seven steps of digital storytelling for parents to help them really think about writing in a first person narrative. We also, uh, also offered writing prompts for parents to think about key moments in gaining access to services. And we created story circles for parents to share stories and to offer discussions and conversations. And lastly, we showed parents how to assemble videos uh, using a Wii video. And parents completed a total of seven videos throughout the process. Uh, the next activity, we had two film screenings uh, for parents. In each screening, we celebrated parents and we watched all the stories created in the workshops. Initially, we presented two visual diagrams. Uh, one of them was called Navigating the System, and then the second was Pathway to Services. And this was based on previous data collected for that we collected uh, during the discussion. Uh, so afterwards, participants watched each video and reflected on their journey and parents discussed what they learned and offers insights and to move forward um, prior to starting action planning phase two. Uh, in addition, our research team conducted constructivist grounded theory, uh, initial line by line coding, on the data collected and focus coding. We developed concept maps. We engaged in memo writing to discover the insights and categories to support findings through the process. Uh, as noted uh, earlier, we used uh, web, Zoom web conferencing and audio recording uh, to auto record activities and transcribe. We also worked uh, collaboratively to find patterns in the data. We presented the information back to the parents for discussion. In the, in the parent film screening, and we collected additional data for analysis purposes. So some of the findings, oh, next slide, please, Erica. Some of the findings uh, in the study are re relevant to the methods that we use. They're broken down into six themes. So the first one is healthcare, retelling the story, seeking a diagnosis to access services. So there are often long wait lists and cumbersome intake requirements for children diagnosed with ASD. Obtaining a diagnosis is vital to early childhood intervention approaches. 
So like find locating services and resources tied to is very important um, tied to early diagnosis. If a child is diagnosed early, uh, there's greater access to hearing about resources. I hear something in the background, Eric. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, yet in order to obtain an ASD diagnosis, parents had to continuously retell their story to healthcare providers and other specialists. In some cases, parents needed to be relentless uh, in becoming experts in their child's medical care to obtain a diagnosis. And parents explained how some doctors were unable to offer a diagnosis or referral, believing the child would eventually catch up, yet parents continued to feel something was not quite right. So they had to be really relentless in trying to, to get the support that was needed to find it, to get a diagnosis, to receive the services that were needed. So also, uh, Accessing the autism diagnosis for children can turn into a long, complicated process for a parent. Uh, learning how to navigate services is crucial to understand where to seek a diagnosis and how we can offer a uh, diagnosis offered uh, in the community. Number uh, The second one is the financial high cost of services paying for care. So access to services can be out of reach for children whose family, believe it or not, exceed the uh, income level requirements and qualifications. Uh, we found that parents perceive qualifying for services by income level as a burden to accessing medical and therapy services needed to care for a child. So parents are often told to call their uh, private insurance company only to find out that services and equipment may not be covered. Uh, parents explain that the high cost of services can be an unfair burden in gaining access to services, so which can lead, result in their child not benefiting from specialized therapy services. So sometimes um, the amount of hours may exceed um, the costs depending on what the insurance can cover and uh, what is needed for the child to improve the quality of life So, or the best treatment plan. So in some cases, private insurance would only cover a specific amount of hours. And also to help cover the cost of services, uh, parents have been apt to become really creative. They've had to, they've had found out about grants word of mouth, basically meeting with other people or talking to the built, someone who does the billing in a department uh, to find different types of grants that nonprofits offer. They describe uh, finding the grants as challenging, but once a parent was able to receive one, it was extremely helpful. And paying for services can take a toll on parents financially with the high cost of services. Additionally, resources such as, uh, again, the grants can reduce the cost, and many parents are unaware of these services and struggle to obtain important information, uh, uh, services for their children. Uh, education actually was another uh, pretty emergent uh, category, challenging the systems, moving schools, and support and services. So interacting with administrators and teachers in schools, remember these parents are trying to find access to support and services. Um, Several of the parents became increasingly frustrated in understanding how medical diagnosis of autism would not automatically qualify a child for services support in the school system. And many of the parents moved their children across public, private, charter, homeschool based on challenges to gain access to services. One parent described moving to a new school only to find herself in the same situation. Uh, we had a parent that moved across Texas to different, different cities, different locations, and was still trying to find the right support for her child. So that's something um, moving across school districts, access services, again, we found it to be challenging and can have a long lasting effect on a family. Uh, employment was another uh, finding of career change and needing flexibility for parents. So parents of children with ASD often have weekly medical appointments and therapy appointments to support the healthcare needs of a child, uh, work accommodations, flexible schedules, health care benefits were perceived by parents as beneficial to work positive work-life balance. So one parent shared with us how she takes her child to work with the support of uh, her supervisor, yet she's been trying desperately to find respite care services for months. This was over the pandemic. And yet another parent left uh, a jobs, other parents either left jobs, downsized to part-time jobs, gave up potential career paths, uh, or worked weekend shifts just to care for a child uh, with autism trying to make sure that they get to their medical appointments and so forth. Um, accessing respite care programs, so finding specialized child care is also something that parents um, have trouble finding uh, with a or, or with professionals that have the training needs to, to care for their children in those settings. 
And um, they're concerned uh, with safety concerns in school settings also contributed to employment changes. Uh, for example, elopement from a school. Parents of children with ASD in our study often consider changing career pathways to meet, manage the care of a child's healthcare needs. So that's vital to know. Also, um, information, searching for answers, facing information overload. Parents express information overload when meeting with caseworkers, describing feelings of being emotionally overwhelmed, you know, uh, when signing up for services, receiving these huge binders, not remembering what they signed up for. Uh, parents suggested that service providers need to offer easy to understand and accessible information. And parents also shared positive experiences in searching for information online through Google searches or asking through online support groups. They uh, turned to free activities, specialized care and training resources for support. That was a positive uh, that we heard a lot was look, seeking, trying to find training for, for parents. Uh, offering accessible information to parents is crucial to help them find the resources they need in healthcare and education settings for services. And um, lastly, the well being uh, was the last finding. Uh, so, being emotionally invested, taking time for care, parents expressed frustration with navigating complex systems to access services. They feeling isolated from the lack of understanding, yet being emotionally invested in supporting their children. Uh, parents expressed being, again, uh, they were trying to find self care activities to support their well being. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to share two quotes uh, that kind of resonate uh, a number of the first one was, um, and the names have been changed for um, to protect our identity. Uh, she could probably qualify for social security with the type of Medicaid. No, she doesn't qualify. I've already applied, you know, and I said, we own a home, we own two vehicles. I mean, this, those are things you need in life. You know, nowadays you have to have two cars, you know, you have to work your husband. Um, you have to, for us to work, my husband works. He's always on the road, you know, and stuff. And I need a car for Amy. So unfortunately that too has gone against you. And, you know, because we have two cars, they think, oh, you have two cars, you can afford these things, but you know what? That's, that's a necessity nowadays. And, you know, and we don't live lavishly, you know, we have a humble home and we don't live beyond our means, but at the same time we have, we had four kids that we had to raise and, you know, not just Amy. So this was pretty much, uh, there was many, uh, several parents in our study that, they were just above the income uh, requirements that they had a hard time uh, with their insurance trying to help find ABA services or respite care services to pay for services. So they felt kind of uh, stuck in the middle. And um, the, last, the second quote is, my doctor didn't tell me, you know, so this was a parent trying to find a diagnosis. She wasn't actually sure what was going on, but she was um, all these professionals that you would think would have this information. So I'm sitting on this chair and I feel like I couldn't breathe and my shoulders were tight and I was there to pick up my older son. And this lady tells me all about information and all I see, all I feel is this release, like, oh my God, you called who? So that was just a pivotal moment in this parent um, sharing the experience that she had in trying to find a diagnosis would eventually lead her to services and support that she needs. Uh, next slide, please. So, and again, we had seven videos. Uh, this is just one that I'm going to focus on. And in the video produced by this parent, it's uh, titled Fighting for Respite Care Services. She described, uh, oh, really quick, we offered writing prompts. So this is what this parent chose to write about a service in particular. She described her experience with a doctor and how he told her to investigate respite care services, make it sound simple. Unknowingly, as she uh, stated, looking for services, she continued to wait months to access them. And the journey can, can be emotionally and physically exhausting for parents, yet they continue to fight for services because they believe their child deserves it. And in the video, um, she just talks a lot about um, how she's feeling in the video and waiting. She's been waiting again during the whole pandemic for months. Uh, being told it's going to be really simple to, to just, just go get respite care services, but the process to get those services to, is taking a very, very long time. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm going to go over the conceptual model in the next slide, but uh, regarding how digital storytelling helps parents reveal, uh, grapple with their experiences. So through the digital storytelling process, we found that parents underwent transformative experiences by reflecting on writing, sharing, and producing their story. 
Uh, in the story circles, they share pivotal moments with one another and heard each other's stories. Parents uh, can use these experiences to continue to persevere with a desire to champion their child's success by telling universal stories, which we found there are patterns of universal stories. We believe uh, it can offer an opportunity to bridge the gap of barriers that impact people's lives, possibly when shared, we hope is when shared with others and other stakeholders in the community. Uh, in limitations, so accommodating schedules to attend online activities, it can be very challenging. We had parents that were hiding in their cars trying to, to, to interview or talk because their children um, are very uh, active. Husband was watching the child. We had parents um, that had to wait till their children were asleep or they were, uh, children were in, in ABA therapy. Uh, it's just really, really challenging trying to get this demographic, these, these parents all together at one time. So there was, again, an effort to be made to be accessible to the parents so that we could make sure that we capture their, their experiences. Um, in addition, our, our research was conducted uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So everything was online. All meetings and events took place during web, Zoom web conferencing. Parents were un, uh, required to have access to computer and microphone at home. Uh, for video editing and connection and with the internet. And if a parent did not have these resources, it may have limited uh, participation and the number of participants in the study. And we also realized that the element, uh, elements of the study may be unique to San Antonio area, may be different across other geographic locations based on income requirements, state policies, and funding opportunities. Next slide, please. So if this is a, an overall model and figure four of the report, the parental experiences and access to services. So it's a conceptual model of the, their experiences. Um, so we're just basically wanted to go over, I just explained the category. So if you look at number one, there's six categories here, but you can, based on each of the category through the cycle, there's a pressure that's created, which forces change becoming uh, exhausting and unsustainable unsustain for parents, uh, difficult to access services. So taking while well, taking a toll on the parental experience is through the cycle. And you can see the connections here uh, where it's taking a toll or to, this particular affects something else. So affects ability to keep fighting, trying to get access to uh, a disability, trying to find uh, meet the requirements, trying to get access to a service. It's just a um, really unique um, cycle here of um, a pressure. And so I just wanted to show this model here that uh, some where it can become, again, we keep hearing emotionally exhausting. So uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so summary uh, stories can serve uh, as resources to serve and educate parents, service providers, and others to address issues with service provisions in the community. Having accessible and up-to-date information is vital for parents in accessing services and sharing the resources. Understanding the daily struggles of parents can expose gaps of services and risk factors. Digital storytelling can offer insights into parents' lived experiences and personal reflections. Next slide, please. So I want to acknowledge all the parents that participated in the study, my faculty mentor, Dr. Fred ortiz Gan. Uh, research team, uh, it's just been amazing. Uh, again, meeting with these individuals bi-weekly. They're all interested in health and well-being uh, and serving the community at our university and actually learning more about action research and CBPR. So we've been able to have great conversations moving forward. Um, also uh, training and support by our graduate student uh, uh, and also Story Center, attended a lot of training at Story Center and they are just amazing uh, to support facilitation guidance as well. And the next, actually this is my last slide, but my next steps, uh, so moving forward, we will be using these stories created in phase one of the report uh, into an action planning phase to implement for phase two, which thankfully, uh, thanks to ARDRA, we will be able to continue this study by engaging additional community members and collaborating with parents. So taking these stories onto the community for the full CBPR process. And thank you for everyone that attended the presentation and thank you to ARDRA for allowing me to take part in the study, my first study. So thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was great. Uh, all right, questions for Michelle. Um, again, feel free to either unmute yourself or to ask it in the chat right there. I can kick us off here. 
Um, this is more of an anecdotal question for you, Michelle, but do you think uh, what parents gained from going through this process uh, is going to be more, I don't know if you can really attribute uh, a scale to it, but do you think that going through the process is more beneficial than the, the product that you have at the end? Uh, or, I mean, they're both beneficial for different reasons, but. Um, yeah, um, I think both probably because we are definitely seeing like some transformation a lot of parents um you know some of the stories can be a little traumatic where they oh you're opening up this you know uh what we've been through we have to reflect on it right but it's important to go through that process um a reflection to become and more empowered to feel like your story matters and it's important and it's powerful and so it, it is a transformation uh, that I think I, I, I saw parents go through where they and then seeing the parents feeding off of each other where one has a question and another parents like well did you look into this or did you look into that so this peer to peer type of interaction that's going on is really amazing as well with the discussions. And that's what I really like about um, learning more about uh, community based participatory research and action research it has been really great and being in those discussions. So I, I think the transformation that you see parents go through and they want to continue working on the study, uh, several of them through the next year, then that took a lot as far as the relationship building that we had with, with our uh, group as well and wanting to take action based on what they learned. So I think it, it all plays a role as well. That's great, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat here. So first we have a question from Catalina uh, who asks, uh, she said, thank you, Michelle, for such a powerful and comprehensive presentation and action research. Um, I, she was wondering if you could share a little bit about the demographics of the 12 caregivers who participated and how you think language, culture, and immigrant status shaped their experiences across the circle. Sure. Um, so we had 12 participants. Again, uh, we really special, focused on... Um, online support groups and nonprofits that worked with the autism community. So many, we had one, one um, male, um, others female, uh, so 11 female. So most of them were mothers, right? And they were participating in the study in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we had uh, different demographics as far as um, Hispanic, you know, Latinas, but we, I think that does play a role because there were some little things emerging as far as culture and we're in here in San Antonio, Texas. So we wanna investigate that further. So I'll have to, we're gonna be working on learning more about that further as well uh, in the next study. But um, yeah, I, I think that plays a role as far as uh, the experiences with this group here that we were working with. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we have another question from Kelly. Uh, Kelly asks, our next steps to try to determine how to improve um, so means says, what are the next steps to try to determine how to improve circumstances and how will you measure that? Okay, so let me read that real quick. Yeah, so the, we're going to let the parents drive the, sh uh, the and I, and I, with CVPR, that's part of the process. It's, a, it's really an emergent process. We're going to uh, be working together with parents to kind of help drive the ship also. What are they interested in? Uh, researching as far as what we've learned in phase one. There was, as you saw, there was many different categories that we could kind of dive into as, um, and whether it be the early access to diagnosis or the wait list, we have extensive light wait lists here in Texas where people, believe it or not, are waiting like 19 years on a wait list for specific services. And so we really need to determine, uh, you know, with, with, C with the action research, it's very, uh, Co, you were co-acting, we're co-learning together. We really need to determine in our next steps through each meeting that we have, then we analyze it and we bring it back into the meeting and then we have discussions. And so that's gonna really drive us into the next action planning phase of where we wanna go uh, to hopefully just prioritize what we wanna focus on for the action planning and then be able to measure that as well moving forward. Great, thanks Michelle. Uh, thank you, Kelly and Catalina. Uh, so I don't see any other questions in the chat, but if anyone does have another question for Michelle, just hang on to it uh, until the end. Uh, but for now, we'll move on to our next uh, researcher and our next presentation. Uh, so next we have Erin McCauley. Erin uh, is a doctoral candidate in sociology uh, in the departments of sociology and policy analysis and management at Cornell University. 
uh, that Aaron this year was also a visiting graduate student at uh, Duke University in the Department of Sociology. Um, and Erin has been a longtime awardee of the, the RDRA program, um, but this will be her last year uh, as next year she has accepted a position uh, as an assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, San Francisco. So, Erin. Well, thank you for that introduction. I also want to start by doing a little pre-apology that I made like a lot of animations in this presentation before I realized that somebody else was going to advance the slides. So we're going to go on an adventure that involves a lot of slide transitions. Um, but as Erica said, my name is Erin McCauley. I'm a PhD candidate at Cornell, but I've been at Duke for this last year. And my faculty advisor on this project is Christopher Wildeman, who was at Duke University. And this project explores um, the transition to adulthood, looking at youth who are aging out of the foster care system. And I'm looking at disability and kind of that intersection with aging out and um, how that shapes employment and SSI, SSDI, RISD and the transition to adulthood. Next, please. Thank you. So we know that the transition to adulthood is a really important moment in kind of the life course trajectory of individuals. There's a lot of decisions that happen in a really quick succession. Just hit next. <laughs> Thank you. So there, there are some examples, you know, you make decisions that have long-term consequences related to education, employment, parenthood, finances. Next. It's also marked by changing social roles. Next. Thank you. So there's, you know, you kind of become more independent from your family unit. You might be transitioning from student to employer. There might be an increasing importance of friendships and different types of social networks. And then there's also uh, kind of a really important part of this transition can be the family resources support and guidance that youth receive, and these can constrain prospects or open opportunities. Next. Okay, next. Thank you. <laughs> so those with disabilities have difficulty in this transition, often needing additional support to navigate these transitions, especially a lot of qualitative work has found that individuals with disabilities and their parents talk a lot about um, the importance of parents for helping youth consider different alternatives or advocating for youth or finding financial support for what the youth want to do, um, but also youth who age out of foster care have difficulty in this transition because they're often facing receding support. Uh, many states kind of at 18 you're done. More recently, there's been continuing support up until age 21 or 25 in different states, um, but this is definitely a receding support situation. Next. And so for those with disabilities who are aging out of the foster care system, they may face both of these issues of potentially needing additional support, uh, but at the same time receiving less support. Thank you. So this study really examines this complex interplay between disability service use and employment and independence in the transition to adulthood for youth who age out of foster care. I employ a secondary data analysis, and so I'm using almost entirely administrative data. There is some population-based data, and I'll talk about the difference um, when we get there. So I'm just going to hop into the data and methods, because this is a really data-heavy project, and so this uh, takes a lot of time. So please excuse my very brief introduction to the concepts we'll be discussing. I have a few research questions. First is how does disability um, type shape employment, looking at full-time and part-time employment in SSI, SSDI benefit receipt at age 21. And so the data that I talk about will cover ages 17 to 21 years old. Next, I look at what services those with disabilities receive during this time period and how it might differ between kind of youth with and without disabilities. And then I also focus in on education and career related services to see how those affect the odds of employment and SSI, SSI, or excuse me, SSI, SSDI receipt at age 21 for those with disabilities. And we're kind of narrowing in on a subset of those services and a subset of this population. And so as kind of a data overview, all of the data I use in this study are from the National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect, which I'll refer to as NDA CAN. And they uh, archive administrative or population data for re use by researchers. An important thing to know about administrative data is that it was collected kind of for the purposes of the program administration and not for research purposes, but then NDA can repackages it and makes it available to researchers. The first data set I use, I refer to as the NIDA data set, and this captures experiences and service use for those while they're transitioning out of foster care. I also use the AFGARS data, which is an administrative data set that kind of reflects uh, foster care experiences. 
And then I also use NCAMS, which is another administrative data set and it focuses on child protective services. And so if you look at these three data sets, we're basically going back in time across the youth's life. And so from the NIDA data, which is short for the National Youth and Transitions data, I use two different files. First, I'll talk about the outcome file. It has three waves of data following youth aging out of foster care. Surveys are done at age 17 for the entire population. A handful of states that have really high foster care populations uh, do sample in the age 19 and age 21 waves, but the majority of states, uh, this is full population data, everyone aging out and then following them for three years, although with a lot of attrition as you might expect from this population. And that has binary indicators for a variety of outcomes related to youth health well-being and success including my outcomes, which is full-time employment, part-time employment, and SSI, SSDI benefit receipt. And for full and part-time employment, this is marked at 35 hours a week. Um, these are not choices I made, these are just choices in the data. There's also a services file, and this is organized kind of different ways instead of being waves. It's six month intervals, and then it's all the youth who are transitioning out who receive services. And they're binary indicators for all the different services, whether the youth receive them in that six months or not. And that includes um, a whole host of services, including educational attainment, career services, training or education. And this is not um, like education someone's receiving, but education about things like budgets or finances, uh, financial support, like housing financial assistance, tuition financial assistance, independent living services, which is a program designed to help youth transition out of foster care, and other services, which is mentoring services and family planning services. So then uh, in some of these analyses, I focused in specifically on services that relate to education or career. Uh, so if the youth was receiving special education services in um, high school, academic supports like GED, academic tutoring, tutoring counseling, kind of getting you through secondary school, post-secondary supports, getting you into and through college, financial assistance, which is tuition, supplies, things like that. Career support, which is like job search assistance, resume support, interviewing prep. And then employment services, which is like apprenticeships, on site trainings, uh, much more applied. And then from this data, I also pulled demographic covariates, including gender, race, urban, non -ur uh, metro, and rural, highest grade completed. I also pull information about the outcome of baseline. So in the models, for example, looking at full-time employment, I do include an indicator of full-time employment at wave one when the youth is 17. And then I also uh, control for if they're involved in education, um, higher education at wave three, just because it might affect employment. Um, and then from the AFGARS data, which is the adoption and foster care analysis and reporting system, which reflects child welfare experiences, I include a number of covariates including the date of first foster care placement, the total number of foster care placements, total days in foster care, if the youth was ever adopted, if they received Medicaid while they were in foster care, the family structure that they were removed from, and if the family was receiving SSI, SSDI. And so one of the um, kind of novel aspects of this study, which I won't talk too much about, is that it is able to go back in time to these administrative data and capture the prior experiences of youth with disabilities in the foster care system. This is really important because there are a few hypotheses about why youth with disabilities struggle even more than youth without disabilities when they transition out of foster care. Um, and one reason is that they may have different experiences in the foster care system as a result of their disabilities, such as having a higher number of placements because foster care parents often don't receive um, kind of training or support in, in how to parent a child with a disability. Uh, and so being able to capture these other potential variations at different times in their experiences through foster care uh, might help capture some of what is considered unobserved heterogeneity in other studies. Thanks. So I also pulled the independent variable from AFGARS um, and some of these analyses, it'll just be disability status overall, yes, no, it's or type of disability. Uh, these types are kind of categories that are collected in the administrative data. Unfortunately, I don't have a ton of um, choice in it myself, but I do collapse a few into emotional or intellectual disability, sensory or physical disability, having both of those types or um, what they categorize as other disability. 
And then finally, I have data from INCANS, which is the National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System. This uh, used the child file, which has protective histories, and it has a number of covariates. Um, the first is reason for most recent reports. Was it risk-related um, for the parent or the child, abuse, neglect, or other? The total number of reports that a child has, the total number of confirmed victimizations the child has, and then if the parent was ever the perpetrator. And so then I go through kind of an effort to harmonize this data using a unique child ID. So it's totally de-identified data um, and some dates have even been shifted with so that youth cannot be identified, but it does have a unique ID. So I reshape the negative outcome and services file so that they're all kind of based on the child level report and they're wide instead of long. And then I link them together. And then I clean and link APGARs to the knighted outcomes and services file. So that's kind of, I have those three data sets there. Um, then INCANS is a really different data set. It's like based on the report and so the child. So there's a lot of reshaping um, and changing of the data structure so that it's based on the child. And then I clean it just so I only have the outcomes I'm interested in. And then I link it to the combined night and AFGARS file. So at the end of the day, I have the youth who transition out of foster care. And then I select just those youth from the prior data sets. So I have information about the youth kind of from the, their first CPS report all the way through to their transition out at age 21. And so for the analytic strategy, I have a few different types of analyses. First, I write a logistic regression examining how disability type shapes employment and SSI SSDI benefit receipt at wave three. I do a descriptive analysis, just looking at the proportion of youth with and without disabilities that receive different services during this time. And then I narrow in on the education and career related services to run a religious a logistic regression, looking at how uh, disability shapes, or excuse me, how service receipt among those with disabilities shape their employment and SSI SSDI receipt. So I'll hop into what I found. So this is just a summary table. What we're seeing is a reported odds ratio. This includes controls for all those different things that we talked about. Um, and then I have stars to reflect the significance values. And so first we're gonna look at full-time employment or FTE. And you can see that having an emotional or intellectual disability is associated with 0.82 times the odds of employment than somebody without a disability. And so what we're finding is that people with emotional or intellectual disabilities have lower odds of employment, um, but having the other types of disabilities is not significantly associated with full-time employment. If we look at part-time employment, we find no significant associations at all between disability type and part-time employment. And then when we look at SSI, SSDI, uh, we see that having any type of disability is associated with between 1.62 and almost three times the um, odds of receiving SSI, SSDI benefit. And so it's not particularly surprising that people with disabilities are, have higher odds of receiving SSI, SSDI, but it was a little bit surprising that disability is not significantly associated with most types of employment um, in the transition to adulthood, likely reflecting low overall employment, both for people with disabilities and people who age out of foster care. So it's kind of a relative disadvantage. Thank you. In table two here, what I'm looking at is just a descriptive analysis. And so on the left are all the different types of services that people can receive during the transition to adulthood. And then the no disability and disability column is reflecting the proportion of youth in that category that received that service at some point during the transition to adulthood. I bold any significant differences, and I also include the p-value for the test of the difference. Um, and so what I found is overall, either the same amount or more people with disabilities were receiving these services than people without disabilities who are transitioning out of care, with the exception of, next, the financial support services. So for housing education, uh, was, or excuse me, housing financial assistance, it was a significant difference with youth with disabilities receiving less financial support. For education financial assistance, uh, it is less, not significantly so, uh, but it's quite interesting that this pattern for these financial support services seems different than the rest. And then last, I narrow in on some of these education or career related services, and I look at how that shapes the odds of full-time employment, part-time employment, and SSI, SSDI benefit receipt for the subpopulation that um, has disabilities. So I'm really narrowing in on among foster care youth who age out, the group that has disabilities, how does receiving these supports potentially shape their, their outcomes? And so what I find um, is that for some of the education-related services, we find a more similar pattern uh, with the exception of the special education services. I don't talk about that in this presentation, but I have lots of hypotheses about why um, 
but people who receive special education services have lower odds of full-time employment than those who do not, uh, but those who receive academic supports and post-secondary supports have higher odds of full-time employment. If we look at part-time employment, we see a significant effect with people who receive career services having a higher odds of part-time employment. And then when we look at the SSI, SSDI benefits, uh, we see that receiving special education services is associated with much higher odds of receiving those disability benefits, um, but all the other academic supports are associated with lower odds and there's no effect of career or employment support services on the odds of SSI, SSDI benefit receipt. And so now I'll talk a little bit about what this means. So to summarize, having an emotional or intellectual disability is associated with lower odds of full-time employment and having any type of disability is associated with higher odds of SSI, SSDI benefit receipt. Youth with disabilities have higher or equal proportion of service receipt, except for different types of financial assistance. And the education services were significantly associated with higher odds of employment and lower odds of SSI, SSDI benefit receipt, although a little asterisk that is excluding special education services. Um, so I have a few conclusions I think come from this work. Youth with disabilities who age out of foster care and just youth who age out of foster care kind of all have low rates of employment. So there isn't a huge kind of relative or comparative disadvantage of having a disability for employment. Youth with disabilities who age out of care are receiving less educational or housing financial supports, although the same or more of the other types of supports. And then youth with disabilities who age out of care should be targeted for education supports to increase employment and independence in the transition to adulthood. And so in a few next steps, I, I wanna look at alternative measures of employment. And so in the employment analyses, I'm comparing full-time employment to kind of everything else and then part-time employment to everything else. And they're not uh, exclusionary categories. So youth can be in both categories. So, you know, I think there's kind of interesting things to do there moving forward. I wanna replicate with future United cohorts. So I used the first cohort, but since I started this, there is a second cohort of data that's been released and then a third cohort that's underway. And then I'm also interested um, in combining across those United cohorts to hopefully increase my sample size so I can disaggregate more in some of those um, outcomes in table three. So in the first one, I was able to disaggregate by disability type, but not necessarily when it comes to the other analysis. And then, you know, I think there's a, an interesting opportunity here for the Social Security Administration or Children's Bureau to kind of look at this population of youth with disabilities who are aging out of care and see if what I find here holds true in a more rigorous design that having supports or services that promote education is really a, a good way to reduce reliance on disability benefits, uh, especially at such a young age. And then also increase employment and independence because you know that has a lot of positive outcomes for people with disabilities and people who age out of foster care. Uh, so I just wanna thank everyone for coming along on this journey. I know we're in a lot of Zoom meetings these days. So thanks for showing up to this one. Thank you, Erica, for advancing the slides approximately 1000 times. And just thank you um, to everyone at, at PRI and the Social Security Administration. You know, this training program and great opportunity has been a big part of my, my graduate career. Um, and it's a really fabulous group to be a part of. And I'm really grateful for these experiences. Thanks so much, Erin. That was great. Uh, and you navigated the slide changes beautifully. You kept right up, even if I wasn't always on cue. So it was good. Yeah, there were like a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. Uh, okay, so questions for Aaron. Um, I'll kick us off again. And do you mind sharing some of your hypotheses for why there's a difference uh, between students receiving special education benefits? Yeah, so this is, I just didn't have time to go through it in this quick of a presentation, um, but this data does not include any type of indicator for disability severity. And so I think that's kind of one of the limitations that we have. And I think that special education is acting as a proxy for disability severity, where, where students who are, are kind of more affected by their disability and at least the educational, which often maps onto work context, um, are kind of receiving special education services, but youth who don't necessarily need that level of support are not. Um, and so in that way, you know, youth who receive special education services might be a proxy for youth who have more severe disabilities. And so we'd expect that to kind of act differently than potentially youth who are identified as potentially being able to go to college, for example, and then getting routed into those type of services instead. Um, and so, you know, with administrative data, we often sacrifice uh, depth for breadth. And so we get a ton of data. This is 
for the most part, population level data for, for every youth who's in foster care. Um, but what that means is that for, for a lot of these indicators, I don't get to make choices about you know how things are measured. Um, and I also don't get to get more information like uh, disability severity. You know, I try to capture some of that. And if the child's disability was the reason that they were removed from the home, that usually is an indicator of, of a more severe disability that the parents aren't able to um, provide for, for that youth. Um, but that's kind of a, a very high level of that measurement. And so there's probably a lot of unobserved heterogeneity that's acting, making special education act differently than other education type supports. Thanks, Erin. That's great. That makes a, makes a lot of sense. Other questions for Erin? All right, if anybody has a, a question for Erin that pops up, again, just feel free to hold on to it until the end. Uh, and thank you so much, Erin. Uh, we will move on to our next presentation. Our, our next researcher is Asher. Uh, Asher Devere Jirasi is a PhD student in public policy and sociology at the University of Michigan. Asher. Thanks, Erica. Um, first off, very impressed with your pronunciation of my last name. That is a very rare skill to have. Um, and <laughs> yeah. Um, so my presentation is on uh, a research project that I uh, conducted over the last year. It's a quantitative research project um, and it's on the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend, which is a really interesting program uh, that has existed in Alaska for the last 30, 40 years. Um, and and uh, so the title is, Can Unconditional Cash Transfer Decrease Poverty Without Decreasing Labor Supply for SSI and SSDI Recipients? Evidence from Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend from 2001 to 2018. So it's the subset of the, the, the experience of this program. Next slide, please. Um, so the policy context and research questions. So uh, the starting point of this research project is is twofold. The United States has two chief disability programs, as we all know, uh, Social Security Disability Insurance and Supplemental Security Income, both of which have been subject to widespread of policy concerns. The first being the potential effect of these programs in suppressing recipients' labor supply is a big concern amongst um, economists, typically. Um, but related to that is the insufficiency of these programs in providing economic stability, dignity, or another kind of way of talking about that is, is poverty. So um, poverty rates amongst both SSDI and SSI recipients have increased over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, next slide, please. And the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend through the way in which it's constructed, it's, it's, it's structure as a, as a cash transfer program, um, hold sort of the promise of, of hitting on both of those concerns, both the labor supply issue, the disincentive for people to work given the structure of SSI and SSDI, um, and the concerns about uh, economic insecurity and chiefly poverty. So the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend, PFD, um, is an unconditional cash transfer that's paid to all Alaska residents. Um, and Unlike most cash transfer programs, it doesn't decrease by one's income. It doesn't decrease if you own assets. It's universal. Um, it's provided to everyone, including SSI and SSDI recipients. Um, very interesting for public policy programs because of course these are federal programs, SSI and SSDI, that often interact with state level programs. And the way in which the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend has been constructed is that they made sure that even SSI and SSDI recipients will receive the full amount of the, the dividend. And the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend, um, just briefly, its history is that it's coming out of the fact that Alaska has oil revenues. Those oil revenues, um, there's a, a big public policy question, what to do with those oil revenues. Um, the decision was made 40 plus years ago at this point that that oil revenues would be distributed to Alaska residents. And so this is an annual cash transfer um, that has been going on again for 40 years. It's guaranteed as a right and it's fully expected of all 
residents that they'll receive this. And one of the interesting parts of this cash transfer for research purposes, particularly on the question of um, its effect on employment, is that the size of the cash transfer is quite stochastic and it fluctuates quite widely dependent on the price of oil, the oil revenues that the state receives. The way in which the program is constructed is that it's supposed to be the five-year average of oil revenues. So therefore, it's quite, um, luckily for research purposes, again, it's quite orthogonal to potential macroeconomic fluctuations. So you can imagine a circumstance that if, um, if there was a boom year, oil prices, oil revenues might be very high. Um, and therefore, there might be a really strong relationship between a lot of people being employed and a very a large cash transfer. But the fact that it's um, these five-year averages means that those, those, the relationship between macro macroeconomic fluctu fluctuations and the size of the ca cash transfer don't have much to do with one another. Um, so we can think of this cash transfer as a, as, um, a plausible source of exogenous variation um, in the, in the, yeah. So um, the chief methodology being used here is a difference in difference estimator that's applied to the um, American Community Survey, the ACS, major survey in the United States, representative, has quite great coverage. Um, and as you'll see later in the presentation, there's another methodology being used, which is the simulation um, exercise. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to show kind of very briefly, this is the size of the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend from 2001 to 2018 in 2019 US dollars. So it's inflation adjusted. And you can see that there's, there's, there's this variation over time and fluctuation. Um, but it, it varies between over $2,000 to a little bit over $1,000. So it's about $1,000 plus dollar fluctuation over, over the last, or over the 17 year period. Next slide, please. Um, okay, poverty and employment amongst uh, adult SSI and SSDI recipients. Um, again, a good, a big concern for for economists is that the employment rate of people with disabilities has dropped as expenditures on SSI and SSDI have risen. Um, chief factors amongst, amongst those typically given are that, that um, the labor supply of SSDI and SSI recipients are, are affected by the weighty effective tax rates on earned in income that these, that these programs impose. Something I think we're probably all familiar with, you know, um, SSI recipients have what's called a 50% implicit marginal tax rate in the sense that each dollar they received as earned income reduces their SSI benefits by 50 cents. For SSDI recipients, earning income over a relatively low threshold, $1,260 for non-blind SSDI, SSDI recipients in 2019, in a month leads to the loss of all SSDI benefits, benefits cliff, um, and threatens their ability to continue to receive benefits. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a really high implicit or effective um, taxes on, on income that these programs impose, um, potentially disincentivizing work. Um, again, a very big concern of economists typically. But at the same time, <clears throat> uh, poverty rates are another set of concern. Poverty rates have risen amongst this population. And just as a one, uh, piece of evidence for that uh, between 2000 and 2018, um, SS, adult SSI and SSDI recipients have seen a three percentage point increase in poverty. Um, it's quite a dramatic increase in, in poverty rates. And it's not merely um, an artifact of, of the data or, or a year and year um, fluctuation. It's, it's been a secular increase. Um, next slide, slide please. So uh, I'm coming to this, I was coming to this research project with two hypotheses. One, um, controlling for all relevant macroeconomic phenomena, an increase in the annual size of the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend within the range of the annual fluctuations that we've observed would not lead to a decrease in the rate of employment amongst working age SSI and SSDI recipients. The second hypothesis 
related to the poverty concern is that had the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend been a national and universal supplemental income transfer program over the same period, poverty rates amongst working age SSI and SSDI recipients would have been sizably less than the rates observed. And again, this second hypothesis is um, it's tested through a, a simulation exercise. So I, uh, as you'll see, I simulate what the effect of, of adding this amount of income um, to, to non-Alaska uh, SSI and SSDI recipients would have what, what effect that would have had on, on observed poverty rates. And then the first hypothesis is going to be tested through the methodology um, in the upcoming slide. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to test that first hypothesis using, again, the American Community Survey, 2001-2018, um, subset it to uh, working age SSI to SSDI recipients. Um, we're just looking at Alaska for the estimate of the effect of, of course, the permanent fund dividend on poverty or on unemployment, I should say, rather. And when I'm conducting the national level simulation, I use all states in the, in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I don't want to get too technical here because it, there, it, it is a complicated methodology slightly. But um, the identification strategy used here is a difference in difference, which for those of you who study statistical methods is of course um, a very widely used methodology, particularly amongst economists, but increasingly amongst sociologists and other disciplines. The, the tricky component here is that I'm, I'm including a synthetic control. And the broadly a synthetic control is a way of creating a control group when there is none. Um, as I talked about when we we're when I addressing the kind of macroeconomic, um, the potential for there to be a relationship between, for instance, oil prices and macroeconomic phenomena. Uh, I wanna I wanna fully eliminate that possibility. So basically what I'm what I'm doing is I'm finding states and populations that are the, uh, the most similar to Alaska for each year based on a host of characteristics, race, gender, um, percentage of the population engaged in the oil industry, um, educational uh, attainment amongst the SSDI, SSI recipient population, um, a whole host of factors. I'm finding which states are most similar to Alaska in every single year. So it could be different states for each year. And then I'm gonna net out the difference um, with Alaska, so that that's that's going to be my control group. Um, so the dependent variable of interest here is this delta term. It's the percentage point year on year change in employment rate of of our of our SSI SSDI recipients, um, minus the percentage point year on year change in the employment rate of adult SSI SSI and SSDI recipients in the control group. Again, so it's a synthetic control group then, and. Uh, subsequently, the year-on-year -year percentage change in the real value of the Alaska Department Fund dividend is regressed on this, this, this uh, delta term. Um, so next slide. So I'm not going to show a table for the results. I think graphically it probably comes out clearer. Um, so this is just um, the relationship between the percentage point change in the, in the, the real size of the, of the permanent fund dividend and the percentage change in employment rate. And as is clear from, from even the image, there's a slight negative relationship. So a percentage change increase has a, has a slight, very, very slight negative effect, but it's, the effect is statistically insignificant. And, and by a whole bunch of um, uh, different ways of modeling this, the same result comes up. Uh, if we use different data, for instance, I use the current population survey as well, the same data uh, result basically comes up. The Alaska Permanent Fund dividend, um, as I hypothesize, has, has effectively no um, effect on employment, even when netting out um, um, the, the synthetic controls or when using synthetic controls. So the, the conclusion there is just that uh, you can give 
SSI and SSDI recipients this amount of money, um, assuming everyone else is receiving the money, and you are not going to see a large negative result. Uh, you're not going to see a decrease in, in the employment tendencies of that population. Uh, next slide, please. So going from that, so establishing that um, this sort of transfer is not going to have these negative results, then the question that I also want to ask is, what would the effect of this program, if it was scaled nationally, be have on poverty rates amongst SSI and SSDI recipients? Um, and from through a counterfactual simulation, meaning adding the size of the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend to SSI and SSDI recipients every year from 2001 to 2018, we look at what, what the observed poverty rate was and what the simulated poverty, poverty rate would have been. And the effect of this hypothetical national transfer program would have been substantial. Um, it's, the results are highly conditional on the way in which I um, categorize recipients, whether I, I categorize um, uh, children as receiving the benefit as well, but the, the, they're, they're substantial regardless. Um, poverty rates would have been decreased by as much as 10 percentage points. It's not 10 percent, it's 10 percentage points. Um, however, for most years, the percentage point reduction is roughly half of that, so about five percentage points. Still, it's an incredible um, uh, percentage point reduction. And importantly, if this program had been national from the 2000, 2000 or 2001 period to the 2018 to until 2018, the three percentage point increase in poverty that was observed over this period would have been entirely eliminated. So it's a, it, the program would have been had a substantial set of, of consequences. Next slide, please. Um, this is a table, not too easy to read, unfortunately, sorry about that, that, um, that summarizes this counterfactual simulation. And so uh, just to give you two kind of points, 2000 of the Alaska or the poverty rate um, um, excluding Alaska for this population is 28%, goes up to 31% in 2018. Um, the poverty rate um, under the assumption that, that we have um, this Alaska Permanent Fund dividend provided to everyone would have substantially reduced the had a substantial effect, whereby, for instance, in 2018, instead of having a 31% poverty rate, you would have had a 18.4% poverty rate. The approximate mean dividend amount is also listed there, it varies between um, 4,600 and, and a little over $1,500. So there, again, this is, this is rough because it's a simulation. Um, there's a lot of um, factors going on in terms of, of how to exactly categorize households and so on and so forth. But just to give a broad, broad image, um, th this, this program, if it had been nationally scaled up, would have had substantial effects. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, I just wanted to kind of calculate um, what the national cost of this program would have been if it's been scaled up. In 2018, the cost of SSI and SSDI roughly was $200 billion nationally. And the cost of scaling up this uh, permanent fund dividend program nationally would have cost roughly one-tenth the annual cost of these federal programs. So, so you know, 20, 20 billion dollars or so. Um, next slide, please. And and again, it depends quite a bit on how you model how you model um, the simulation, but but we're looking at at range, ranges between um, uh, nine uh, billion dollars and again twenty billion dollars. But um, you know, this is not not of course the final word on how much a program of this um, of this size would would cost um, or this nature would cost, but but it would have a substantial effect on poverty and it would be within the realm of a, a reasonable increase in the in the SSI SSDI programs um, at just one tenth at, at most one tenth the cost of the programs annually. 
Um, next slide. And just some conclusions. So going back to my first hypothesis, the structure of the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend proves to be a non-labor market discretionary way of raising the incomes of SSI and SSDI recipients. Um, and again, a simulation exercise strongly suggests that had this program been national from 2000 to 2018, the rise in poverty amongst um, adult SSI and SSDI recipients would not have occurred. And kind of a broader, more general point is that the evidence from, from Alaska and the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend may suggest that programs structured like a uh, universal basic income may prove to be an efficient way of reducing poverty without having um, uh, labor market distortionary effects. So, so that's my work. Um, hope to, to uh, polish it up a little bit and, and uh, maybe submit it for publication. Um, really appreciate uh, your time. And of course, I so, so appreciate all the support um, from PRI and, and the Social Security Administration. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Asher. That was great. Uh, questions for Asher. Aaron, do I see your hand raised or is that clapping? It was clapping. It was very enthusiastic clapping. Thank you for that presentation, Asher. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, actually, I have a question. I have a question for you. I'll, I'll uh, get us started here. I think you've um, your study really came at a pretty unique time, um, given the COVID nineteen crisis and some of the uh, UBI plans that we've seen proposed within that time, and some other somewhat similar, not exactly UBI plans, but um, you know, like the child tax credit is somewhat similar. But you know, we've seen plans like this uh, be proposed for I think like the 1700s was when we first kind of started seeing some of these plans come out. So, have there been any plans recently that you've taken a look at, and given your um, background and, and your research, that you think could be really scalable to uh, scalable and effective for especially those receiving SSI and SSDI? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Actually, it's interesting you bring up the the child tax credit. So, Luke Schaefer at the University of Michigan has been advocating that for the last, I don't know, five years, seven years, been talking to Mitt Romney and other senators and Congress people. Um, and, and he he has done a lot of this kind of simulation work in this front um, as a way of pushing forward that policy program. And it's incredible that now it really has become law. And I, I, I don't think it's like stretched to say that Luke Schaefer's work in that domain was instrumental in that becoming law. I think that type of policy through the tax code even, um, would have very similar effects to Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend. Um, sure, it's just it's just for those uh, households with children, but of course those are the households that often um, are in most distress or are closest to poverty. Um, so I, th I think really yeah, that example is almost the most optimistic scenario, that kind of refundable tax credit, universal. It would have the, the universal properties of the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend. One thing I didn't stress in my presentation, um, but like an econo economist would think this is kind of particularly interesting is that there are these general equilibrium effects that would happen if a program was, you know, state-based or national-based rather than just SSI and SSDI recipients, for instance. And that, that same uh, dynamic is going on, for instance, with the child tax credit. So I think, I think there's a lot of uh, you know, room within that kind of structure of using the tax code to push forward a policy of uh, the kind of Alaska Permanent Fund dividend nature. And also, for instance, that child tax credit, um, the way in which it's been designed is that it, tar it it's not very targeted. It's, it's quite universal. It hits households that have, you know, what wouldn't be deemed uh, low incomes typically. Um, so there, there's not the employment distortionary sort of effects that, that you might see with, you know, the structure of SS, SSI, for instance, or other low income transfer programs. Um, but you are right, Erica, this has been a conversation for 200 years, um, and it, it hasn't come into being quite yet, although we've gotten very close, of course, during uh, Nixon's time, actually, and, and uh, 
And right now with the child tax credit, the refundable portion, and if it's scaled up even greater, I think that's a really optimistic route. Great, thanks for that, Asher. Uh, other questions for Asher? We'll um, open the floor for questions for any of our other participants as well. I uh, should let you know that all of our students' research will be posted on the RDRAW website within the coming weeks. Um, and if you do have any questions that pop up, feel free to, to reach out to me at rdraw uh, at prainc.com. Um, but if that is it, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to all of our, our researchers. Um, and I encourage you all to attend our, our next uh, webinar sessions. It'll be the 24th through the 26th. Um, and we have a lot of uh, interesting presentations coming our way. So thank you so much for joining us today, everybody. Um, and thank you so much to our researchers.